going to not get you fired up. Amen? Man, it is great to be here. Super to be here. Um, you know, like Luke did a, a couple of weeks ago, he, you know, you guys don't know me that well. I just came in, and I, I did want to just tell you a little bit about myself. I did bring some pictures. You like Luke? Yeah, no laughing. Okay? But I'm sure you will. It's all good. But I became a disciple back in 1987 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we came out of the traditional church, started our own little ministry there. And for about five years, we had no paid full-time ministry, but we cranked the ministry. We would grow to 100, 150, and then 20 or 30 people would go out. We'd grow again to another 150, sometimes 200, and people would go out again. And that happened for five solid years. And then finally, I moved on to the Chicago church, was about 2,500 at the time. And then um, I was there for a year. We moved on to Denver, which was about 1,200 people at the time. And that was awesome. And then went out to plant the Salt Lake church as a part of that team. So I've been around a little bit, um, still trying to figure it out. Amen. Still trying to figure it out. Um, Um, a little bit about me in uh, 2002 and three, when everything and up evil in the kingdom, I had to make a choice to leave my kids and my family and move to whether it was a ministry or not. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And I didn't move because I couldn't leave my kids. But it started a re chain reaction in my heart. And you guys know the, the verse in the Bible that says, the man turns back and as a pig turns back to the wallow, yeah. it just gets in the mud. Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty sinful before I became a disciple. Went through a divorce and my life absolutely fell apart. This is the first time I've been up in front of somebody like this in 15 years. God is good, right? God is good. God is great. So, that's a little bit about me. But now I'm going to show you a couple pictures. Now this first picture I'm going to show you is... Right? Right? Is that not happening or what? I'm just saying, back in the day, it was cool. Yeah, where was my brother supposed to back me up on this? I said a couple of us, he's supposed to say, it's cool, it's awesome! Oh, thank you, bro. So that's what I used to look like. <laughs> and you know, for you, for you people that are a little older, we're a little older, we look up and then we go, what was I thinking? You know? But I'm going to show other, some other pictures. Uh, uh, I think this is a picture of my two daughters coming up. This is my two daughters. Um, Kate, Caitlin is on, the, on your right, and Kayla's on the left, and Kayla's the oldest. And she has three kids. She has, I have two granddaughters, Aspen and Remington, who are eight and seven. And the little guy who turns a year old in about two weeks, his name is Lawson. I did another picture of my, this is my daughter and her husband and her nieces and nephews at a birthday party. And then the next picture I think is my daughter. Yeah, there's my daughter and, and God, grandkids are awesome. I miss them. I miss them so much. Now, I, I'm going to relate to you in these next three pictures. My heart as a grandpa, okay? Go ahead. Hey, when you get, it's Halloween, I want some candy. You know, so I got to think of an excuse to go. So, let's look at the next one. Pop 
Eva, what are you gonna be this year? What are you gonna dress up as? Baba, Baba. One more. Right? This is my son-in-law, Chase, my oldest daughter's husband and the three kids. You want to throw that one up there? Mr. Little Lawson right here. Got big blue eyes. Okay, and the last picture, go ahead and throw up there. This is, this is my brother. And uh, my brother's one of my heroes. This is in uh, Iraq in the early 90s, and he's hanging upside down from the Euphrates Bridge, and he's disarming ammunition, or disarming bombs that were set to blow the bridge. When they blew the bridge, only half of it blew. So there were still two lanes going across. One half blew off, and the other one didn't. So he's hanging upside down, taking bombs out of that hole, disarming them, and dropping them into the Euphrates River. This actual scene you see right here is done in a display in the Army Museum, okay? And it's got the embedded reporter who talks about the situation and stuff. And my brother was an enlisted man. He went to the very highest you could become as an enlisted man, as a command sergeant major. And so very proud of my brother and his service. Amen. <laughs> Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Not yet? Okay. All right. All right. Okay, I had a vision last night. I was laying in bed and had a vision. I was at the pearly gates and, and uh, good Lord was walking me around. And we were walking around and, and uh, he's showing me all of heaven, you know. St. Peter was. And we come upon Mohammed. And Mohammed's walking around and he is chained to this hideous creature. Hideous. I mean fangs, horns, slobber. I mean, I'm like, I'm like, St. Peter. He said, well, you kind of know how sinful Mohammed was. So this is his punishment. This is his punishment, okay? So we're walking along a little farther and, uh, and uh, cruise around. He's showing me the streets of gold and all this stuff. And I come upon Gustavo. And Gustavo. And Gustavo is chained to two of them. Two of them. And I'm like, I mean, he says, yeah. He was even worse than Muhammad. Oh. I'm like, oh man, I'm not feeling very good about myself at this point. So we're walking along there, and we're going on, and I see Howard. Oh. Where's Howard? Oh. Must be with the kids. I think he ran out on this one. <laughs> but, uh, but I see Howard with this beautiful six foot two Amazon woman, just gorgeous, dressed to the T. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait. Hey, um, uh, I mean, I know Howard and he was sinful. And St. Saint Peter says, whoa, 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 no, no, you don't get it. This is her punishment. Oh! Howard, Howard, I love you wherever you're It's good to be here. It's great to be here. The word work is used 683 times in the Bible. 683 times the word work is used. So it must be pretty important. The title of my lesson is Great Workers, Great Leadership, Great Jobs. Great, leader, great leaders are great workers. Great workers have jobs. What does, it, what does it mean to be a leader? 
What does it mean to be a leader? Okay, all right, all right. I'm gonna tell you a secret. I'm gonna tell you a juicy secret, okay? Can you keep it to yourself? Yeah, okay, all right. Most of, in this in the, most of us in the room, in this room here, will never be full-time paid ministry people. 98% of us will not. I'm gonna let you in on another secret. Are you listening? Yeah, listen. All right. The full-time ministry does not move the church. The full-time ministry has vision and heart and diligence and organization and care and love and passion. Um, I thought maybe I was getting the hook right here. No. Remember in the first century, the word spread, right? Yeah. Everywhere. Yes. It happened in, in Acts, right? Yeah. With the stoning of Stephen, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody dispersed and went all kinds of places, right? Mm -hmm. Did the word of God keep growing? Yes. Big time, right? Yes. Right? No full-time leaders. None. Zero. Paul even provided his needs. As a church, we've got to mature. We have a lot of young Christians in the faith in general. And so my, my lesson is about your job, your hard work, your leadership. It will all come together at the end of this lesson. Your job is your ministry to the world. Now, we'll come back to it, but I want you to, I want you to hear that. Joseph in the Old Testament was a shepherd. A shepherd's work isn't a lot of fun, okay? You have to be in the elements, whether it be freezing rain, cold, sub-zero temperatures, humidity, little sleep, because you have to protect the sheep, right? But that's a, this is a job. It's physical energy that you have to put out. And so Joseph starts at a young age, and so he gets a little preparation. He gets a little character developed, right? Yeah. Think about this. Shepherds were generally considered unclean in the community of God's people because the work they did. They were daily, in, honestly, they were just dirty, smelly people because they were hanging out with the sheep and manure and in the elements, right? Most of us don't want that kind of job. Right? But this was their job. This is what made them who they were. They were laborers. Turn over to Genesis chapter 37, verse 24. Joseph's second job behind being a shepherd. When Reuben heard this, well, let me just set the stage. Joseph has told us, go check on your brothers. They've been gone a while. Here's what I want you to do, son. Go check on them, okay? This is your job today. Go check on them. So he's going to see him. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. They took him and threw him in the cistern, the cistern empty, and there was no water. His job for that, his job that day, he got thrown in the toilet. Sometimes we go to jobs and we feel like we're in the toilet. Right? Sometimes our jobs aren't the best. And obviously, Joseph's bosses were his older brothers. Okay, not a lot of love lost there. But he threw him into the cistern. 
What you do and your job is very important in the overall scheme of who you are as a disciple and what you will become and what this church will become. Genesis 39, chapter 2, or verse 2. This is his second job. The Lord is with Joseph, so he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw the Lord, he was with him. The Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted him to the care of of everything he owned. From that time, he put him in charge of his whole household and all that he owned. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessings of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Joseph was an excellent worker. Do you know people on your job who are excellent in what they do? Yeah. Do you admire them? Yeah. 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 I mean, you're like, mm, I'd like to be like him, but he really works hard. Joseph's second job, he's put in a position to thrive. Okay, not so much as the shepherd, not so much as the little brother, but now he's in charge of a whole household. The whole household did not, Joseph just didn't sit back and say, everything's going to be taken care of. He was a sun up to sun down kind of person. And he made it happen. You know, I think of Chris back here. Everything you see takes work. Here, you see all this equipment back there? Chris, what time do you get here in the morning? Eight o'clock. Some of you are just getting out of bed Sunday at 8 o'clock. It takes an incredible amount of work to be somebody that people look into your life and go, I respect Chris. Sometimes you're in the right place to thrive. Okay? So you need to thrive when you're there. Because sometimes... You may not be there. Um, Genesis 39, verse 19. You never know what's going to happen next. When his master heard the story, his wife had told him. Now, we know what's happening. Joseph is a big strapping man here, you know, kind of like Luke here, you know, he's strong. He's <laughs> handsome, you know. Uh, uh, and, and so he's excellent in everything he does. And so, ladies, would you be attracted to somebody who might be a good provider, who's excellent in what he does, who's honest, truthful? truthful? Are those some of the things that you look forward? Yeah. Right? Huh? <laughs> right. Right. And the ladies are looking for that in you, brothers. Okay, let's keep going. That was free. All right. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how the slave treated me? He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where king's prisoners were confined. Sometimes life will throw you a curveball in your job. Sometimes life will just flat throw you a curveball in your job. You're up here and things are going awesome and you're an incredible employee, right? Joseph's, Joseph's rocking it, man. He's, he's got everything under control. And all of a sudden, what happens? Things out of his control take his knees out. Okay? So guess what? He has to start over. What he had to do was he had to put his head down and just work. So he goes to the prison and then what happens? He becomes head of the prison, right? He just 
put his head down and worked. In those curveballs, God is preparing you for something. All right? He's preparing you for something bigger. Genesis chapter 41, verse 41. Joseph gets put in charge of all of Egypt. You think you'd look up to somebody like that? You know, when you really meet sharp people and you walk away, you go, you really do. You're like, that guy's way above me up here. Way above me. And so Joseph distinguished himself that much that the whole country was his. It was his job. And because of his job, he had influence. Because he was a hard worker, he became a leader. A leader in the Old Testament, one that has a prominent place in all of the Old Testament. Because he was a worker on his job as a shepherd, failed, got his knees cut out, also did a good job, and rise to the top again. So remember that your job, hard work, is true leadership. And we're going to talk about that as we keep going. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 16. All right, I'm going to give you guys the app. Don't you guys like an inside track to something? Yes. When somebody says, let me tell you how to, you know, you need, you need to drive around here and go around here, and you can park closer right over there for free. You're like, uh-huh. I've been driving here all this time. I'm parking way out there. Somebody had to let you in on something, didn't they? I was like, okay, I got, I got the ticket now. And so I'm going to let you in on the best route to leadership right now. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 16. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than any who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much wisdom and knowledge. Then I pride myself to understanding wisdom and also madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after wind. Solomon, for you that need a little background here, Solomon was king, becomes king, and God asked him, hey, listen, I will do whatever you want me to do for you. And because Solomon's heart was, give me wisdom to lead the people. Okay? God says, um, that's a good response. Uh, I think not only will I do that, I'll give you the things you didn't answer, you didn't ask for. I'll give you dominance over your enemies. I will give you riches like none before, and you will be the wisest men to ever live. So Ecclesiastes is this story of Solomon experiencing all of life and coming to some conclusions about that life, okay? So he goes on and Solomon says, I tested pleasure and laughter. I tried cheering myself on wine, embracing folly. I took on great projects. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards, planted parks, fruit trees. I made a reservoir to grow trees. I bought male and female slaves. I owned herds and flocks like none other in Jerusalem before. My gold, there had never been as much gold in Jerusalem as before. And verse said, I, decide my, I, just, I denied myself nothing. My eyes desired and I refused my heart no pleasure. That sounds like this guy's rocking life, right? Think about it. He's the man. He's king. All gold, all wisdom, all wine, everything the world has to offer, Solomon has, okay? And so now he's gonna relate to you what he thinks about it all. Chapter 2, verse 24. A person can do nothing better than eat and drink and find a little satisfaction in their own toil. 
This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing wealth to hand over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. How many of us want wisdom, knowledge, and happiness? Yeah, I want some wisdom, I want some knowledge, I want some, I'm it. So, think about it. He's experienced all this and he's relating to you what's important. Eat, drink, and find a little satisfaction in your work. Now, chapter 5, verse 18. It's going to come together eventually. This is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toils, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with what? (laughs) Gladness of heart. Guys, if I had the screen up here and those two screens, I would have it just flashing, flashing. Pay attention, I'm about to give you the keys to your life on earth. The best a person can do in this lifetime is to eat and drink and find a little satisfaction in his work. That's it. That is all you have in this lifetime. You can seek for everything there is. And Solomon did, and he comes and he lets you know. Eat, drink, find a little satisfaction in your work. Because if you do that, God will give you the desire of your heart, happiness, and wisdom. Some of us chase after a lot of things. Some of us don't like our jobs. Some of us hate working. You're never, ever going to be happy unless you embrace your work. Because work and your job brings leadership. What happened in the first century? No full-time people. They went out and then Paul said they entrusted this thing to what kind of people? Entrusted to people who were reliable. Are you reliable on your job? Do you have a job? You know, if, if you're a campus student and it's the summertime, why aren't you working 40 hours a week? Because your job is a part of your ministry. And if you're just hanging out on the campus all the time sharing, is that great? Yeah, but you're lopsided. You don't have it together. Because your job is a main point of what you do. It gives back to the people around you and it gives back to the church community. Paul didn't spend every day in the temple. We're going to get to that. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. All right. Chapter 12, verse 13. This all brings this, this together. Now all has been heard for the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. 
Wow. I don't know about you, but if, well, I know about me. When I went back to the world and I was doing all the things that Solomon was doing, I, I didn't fear God. That wasn't my conclusion. But Solomon kept his wits about him in all of this so he could explain to us that you're fearing God and keeping his commandments is to work, eat, drink, and if you do that, he's going to give you perhaps wisdom and knowledge and let you enjoy the days of your life here on this earth. Okay? So the whole thing is premised about Fear God. Keep his commandments. I've done all of it, and it doesn't mean anything. And the older you get, you understand that things don't mean very much. The things that you used to worry about, the things you used to fret over, they're not that big. Okay? Fear God. Keep his commandments, because he's going to bring everything into judgment. Let's move on. got to find out where I'm at now. I want to tell you a little story about me, a little share a little bit about me. Um, when I was living, I, I always had a dream to, for me, I wanted my wife to be able to stay home with my, with my children. And at that time, I had a one and a half year old. And between the two of us, we were making really good money. Her more than me. And that's one of the things I wanted to change. I wanted to be able to let her stay home. And I wanted to be able to raise my income to the level where I could have her stay home. Now, everybody has personal different goals and not everybody can do those things. But I'm sharing with you what happened to me. And so for two years, I begged God. Help me to be disciplined. Because doesn't hard work take discipline? I begged him, please create a disciplined heart in me. Because I knew if I was ever going to get to a place that I could make these things happen, I really had to become a Joseph. I really had to become somebody who could manage, be disciplined, and be a hard worker. And when you do that, God elevates you, just like it happened to Joseph. So we asked, you know, go, go to Salt Lake, help the team. We're like, I'm like, yeah, great. And my wife's like, uh, how are we going to live? And I'm like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Does that sound like a guy? I don't know. We'll figure it out. But what did she want? I want everything planned out, right? And I said, I don't know. I said, but I know it's the right thing to do. And I've been praying to God, and it's, a, it's probably the best opportunity for me to be able to make this transition in our marriage, in our, in our relationship. And so two weeks later, she comes home and she goes, hey, you know what? My company just offered for the first time a voluntary severance. And they're going to give me a year's salary. And we're going to give me six months for the health insurance wow. if I want to take it. <laughs> she turned around. I was like, <laughs> but God does things behind the scenes to make things happen. So I went out a month before anybody. I found a rental house. And I took the very first job, regardless of what it was. I found a pest control job. Now, I've been in sales all my life, for the most part. And this is not the job. You know, we went from 100,000 to 25,000 in 1994. Make a little deficit there, right? <laughs> Just a little bit, right? And I'm like, 
But I had to work to get there. I wasn't, I wasn't selective on the job that I took. I took whatever I could to continue to work, to move up the ladder, to continue to put out resumes, to continue to was right, so I could get to that next level. Some of us are too proud to go take whatever job it is to get you on the highway to move to the right place. You got to understand that now is the time. Work is leadership. <clears throat> so, I'm praying, crying out to God. And I'm really praying now. <laughs> And I remember to this day, I mean, you guys, everybody's had similar, probably, things. I remember sitting in this bedroom all by myself, four weeks before anybody got there. I went to the Goodwill, or Salvation Army, whatever they call them here, and I bought a mattress and a folding chair and a 13-inch black and white TV. And I had a nice, I had a nice car and a nice house back home in Denver and all this stuff, and I'm sitting in this little room going, what am I doing? But I got on my knees and I prayed. And I'll never forget that day. Because I don't think I cried more to the Lord any other time in my life. And I said, God, I'm desperate. You've got to change in me that character. So I want this dream for her to be able to stay home with our kids. I'm working this job. I'm happily spraying houses. You know, I'm doing my thing. I'm putting out a resume, and Nestle calls me. And Nestle says, go in, I have an interview. He says, okay. Definitely a bump in pay. Amen? Amen? Not what I needed, but it was moving in the right direction. Amen. And then, I'm working this job. I'm like, oh, I'm but I didn't tell you, as soon as my wife came out, two months later, she was pregnant with our second one. So I'm like, oh, 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 man, God is just turning up the heat. So I work, I'm, I'm, I'm a year into it. We have our youngest child. And I get a letter from Nestle that says, we have this program for all employees that for your first year, you get free formula and diapers. Right? Right? Thoroughly convinced that if my tears wouldn't have happened, it wouldn't have happened. Because God is an incredible Father. He loves you so deeply. But that's not it. I'm still not where I can take and my wife can be home. And so I continue to pray. And I continue to work. So just like what happened to Joseph, he got thrown in prison. Two years later, they laid off my division. Man, I was moving in the right direction. I was a hard worker, though. My boss, there was four of us in our division, and he always called me to make everything happen with everybody else. And I was like, okay, yeah, all right. This is a good thing. So I got recognized. I started to get recognized for my hard work. When you start to get recognized for your hard work, people start to look. Hey, got something going on. So I get laid off right after Christmas. And I'm like, okay, God. All right. You got to have something better. <laughs> so we're living on our savings. Three weeks later, I run into a friend of mine who was from Denver, and he was a regional manager for a construction company. And uh, he said, he said, bro, you're, what happened? I just explained to him, he said, you're free? And I said, I know, right? I did not what I meant to be. And uh, he said, let me talk to my boss. So a week later, I get a call. And I'll never forget it. I knew, I knew his boss a little bit. And, uh, John said, so I hear you're free. And I'm like, I don't want to be. 
Uh, yeah. And John says, I want, I want, you to, I want to bring you on and make, make you a uh, project manager. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about construction. <laughs> Okay. Well, what, I, you sure? He said, "Yeah, I can teach you everything. Won't be, it won't be long at all. You, you will do great. I know you. Larry's talked to you up. You are gonna be. You're gonna do just fine." So I'm like, "Okay." So he proceeds to tell me that not only does my salary double. Oh. Now I have a truck and a cell phone, even though it might have been a brick looking one. Um, and by the way, I'm gonna pay for all your insurance. God is good. But it was because of my hard work that created a leadership in me, that created me to take care of my ministry, that created people to look in my life and say, Something's, this guy's got something going on. And I didn't have to be in the temple or on campus every day because God was creating something through my ministry of work. Now I could provide also for the church more, for the church community more. And it became a part of my worship service to God. Because remember, the best you can do is eat and drink and find a little satisfaction in this world. And God will give you the understanding and wisdom and make it good for you. Because I was fearing God. Nobody in the first century had a full-time ministry that I know of. Now, some of them were supported for a little while, but not in general. I mean, Paul was supported for a little while, but most of Paul's life was working and his companions. That's where we're going next, Paul. Acts chapter 20, verse 33. This is Paul talking. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companion. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, you must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord said himself, it is more blessed to give than receive. Now, Paul was in situations where he was in prison and other places, and his needs were taken care of by that. And he continued to preach. But most of the places he went, Paul was a tent maker. Paul didn't go into town and set up a tent making business. Tent making businesses were big. You had to sew cloth. You had to be a woodworking person. You couldn't just go in, that, in a town at that time and set up a, a business. You had to go through the right channels. So Paul was a laborer. He went in town and said, okay, I need to work for somebody. I need to work for some. I'm just a laborer. Laborers usually work hard. It's interesting. Get to the right point here. Good thing for notes, right? Amen. Paul was an incredibly hard worker. Somebody gave him the skills to do what he did as a young person when he got his first job. Yeah. A lot of you are on your first, second, third, fourth, fifteenth, twentieth job, but you're learning trades and skills and how to deal with people. Paul, same thing. When he went into town, he used the skill when somebody hired him when he was young. You know, I've had now have my own business for 30 years now. And uh, ooh, um, I've had degreed people, let's say position A. I've had degreed people in that position who weren't worth a flip. 
I've had degreed people in that same division, in the same position, that were awesome. Position A, the same one. I've had non-degreed people in that position, they were flipped. And I've had non-degreed people in that same position who were incredible. What's the difference? Excuse me? Excuse me? Some of us really work harder at staying out of work. And I know a lot of these things I'm saying is touching some hearts in here. Because it's what we need as a church to grow in. If we're going to grow and be what we want us to be, we have to mature in our personal work ethic. Because the people in the first century did it. And they worked just to live. I remember being young. It was a while ago. <laughs> and I was working with this older gentleman. She was probably in his 40s then. This isn't old now. It's young, but. He said to me, Mike, I really like you. I'm like, okay. Nice guy. He said, but you need to learn one lesson. And I was like, okay. He said, 90% of success is just showing up every day. That's true. Every day. Sometimes when you're sick. Sometimes when you don't feel it. But you show up every day. Because what is an employer looking for? I know me, having employees, I want somebody that I can count on. He said, you know what, Mike? He said, if you show up every day, eventually good things will happen. He said, even if you're not a great worker, he said, just show up every day. Some of us miss more work than we go. But here's the cool thing. You never know what the co-worker around you or the leader around you is going to have. You don't know what's going on in his life. So he said to me, you know, you may just be the guy sweeping the floor, but next week you may be the guy in charge of the warehouse. Because the boss goes... Okay, we just lost one of our supervisors. What, what are we going to do? Well, you know, Mike, he's, you know, he's a decent worker. But you know what? He's here every single day. Every single day. We never have to worry about him not being here. Let's just slide him right over. Learning to be disciplined in what you do. For Paul, tent making was his exclamation point. For Paul, tent making was planting the flag. He had every right to be a full time minister and be supported by the church, didn't he? Yeah. Absolutely. Most effective minister behind, besides Jesus. But he said, This is my flag. This is my ministry. I have to work. I have to show an example. I've got to be able to give to the community of people in this church. 
how does it make you feel when you have somebody who's a leader who's right there beside you, who's getting up the same time you do every day, who's going out and working his tail off, he's coming home, he's getting out, he's getting with the brothers, he's getting with the sisters, he's not telling people what to do all the time, he's actually doing it out there all the time. How does that make you feel? Who you want to follow? Paul planted a fag and said, follow me. He was a worker. Your job and your hard work leads to an everyday thriving ministry. Every day. How in your Bible talks, in your family groups, regional sectors, whatever they call them nowadays. <laughs> how, what would it be like if you had somebody who was that dependable all the time? Everybody in your group. Whoa, what was right? Whoa, what could you do? What could you not do? You got to see that true leadership is true discipline and working hard. Paul financially supported the church as well. That's just a little byproduct. And you know what's cool? When you work, when you, no. When you work hard, say you worked really hard for two weeks and get that paycheck. You know, cash it, put a little jingle in your pocket. Feeling a little good, had a little success this week. You know, we worked the ministry, got a little money in my pocket now. How's that make you feel? Fired up. Huh? I, I can actually go buy me a soda pop if I want. <laughs> I might even be able to buy two soda pops. I might even be able to go Subway this week. Might even be able to buy lunch for somebody. See, your job is your ministry in this life because it's the best you can do. Eat and drink and find a little satisfaction in your work. Because fear God and keep his commandment. The term bivocationally is often used to indicate two separate professions involved. The money earning one, the ministry one. Paul's example showed all aspects of life. Should be a seamless witness to others. There is little room to draw distinction between professional ministry and vocational ministry. We all want to be these leaders. If you want to be that, you be a hard worker. And your ministry will grow and thrive. One of, I'm, getting, I'm bringing it ready to close here. I'm getting a hammer shine here. So, um, parents, if you're a parent, if you're, raise your hand if you're a parent here today. Most of them are probably, amen, amen. Got a lot of good parents. One of your main responsibilities as a parent is to teach your kids to subjugate what they want to do versus what needs to be done. Yeah. It's the biggest lesson in life. Yeah. Parents, teach your kids to do what you ask them to do first. When they come home from school, do they know the first thing they got to do is do their homework? When I was a kid and come home, that's not what I want to do. I want to go play. <laughs> but you teach them to subjugate what has to be done versus what you want done. Yeah. Okay? Same thing in working. Same thing in everything you do. How about getting up for a quiet time? I want to sleep in. But what I need to do is this. Yeah. Some of you really need to take this lesson to heart. Because I've talked to a bunch of you about different things. And what time we get up. What time did you get up this morning? 11? 
Guys, you've got to learn to subjugate what you want to do versus what needs to happen. I just don't have enough time. I'm going to get, I'm going to close out with Paul's motivation. Stephen was killed for his faith in Acts chapter 7. He persecuted the church. And so he was killed. And who was standing there watching him? Paul. Paul. Acts chapter 8. On that day, great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, mourned deeply for him. Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he drug off men and women and put them in prison. Saul's on his way to Damascus to do the same thing, and a bright light shines around him. Bam! God, Jesus says, hey, hey! What are you doing? What are you doing? Paul's like, "Uh uh-oh, you're persecuting me, okay? So Paul gets up, he's blind for three days. Do you remember over in Ecclesiastes where it says that, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For three days, I think Peter, Paul feared God. For three days, he tried to comprehend what he had missed. He was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a church person. He missed it. He missed the Messiah. He'd been looking for it with all the rest of them. He missed it. And he was the guy. What do you think was going through his head in those three days of blindness? God, what have I done? Probably some point during that time, which he says he was praying, he probably looked into the eyes of Stephen and remembered it. The only thing that can change your character to be a good worker, to be a good leader is this, is recognizing who you are. From that, Paul's life changed forever. If you guys want to be a good leader, if you want a good life as good as you can get it today in this world fear God and keep his commandments eat and drink and find a little satisfaction in what you do move your ministry and be an example to others around you Paul was motivated by grace true leadership is a balance of seeking and saving the loss and our everyday working life